Hey guys, today I'll show you a supernatural horror TV series named Fringe, Season 3. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama picks up from where the last season left off with two Olivia switching their places. The primary Olivia was trapped in the parallel world, while parallel Olivia sneaked into the primary world and infiltrated the Fringe Division as a spy. Parallel Dr. Walter tried to replace primary Olivia's memories with those of parallel Olivia, hoping to turn her into one of his own. He used psychological suggestions and injected her with drugs. However, Olivia is strong-willed and highly drug-resistant, so it was of no use. Frustrated, Parallel Walter instructed his assistant to increase the dosage, but that proved futile as well. When Olivia wanted to escape, no one could stop her, so she easily took the opportunity to break out, hijacking a taxi and continuing her fugitive life. Meanwhile, Lincoln, the team leader of the Parallel Fringe Division, who was sent to capture the time travelers and got injured in the explosion, was in serious condition. However, thanks to the advanced medical technology of the Parallel World, he was able to walk again. Charlie came to visit him and mentioned that Olivia was having mental issues. However, only the defense minister and Philip knew about Olivia acting as a spy from the primary world. Everyone else was kept in the dark. At this point, Parallel Philip called the two of them in, lying that Olivia had run away without accepting mental treatment. He hoped they could help find her. Olivia discovered a mark tattooed on the back of her neck, apparently an attempt to make her believe she was the Parallel Olivia. She arrived at the opera house where the world jumping had taken place, hoping to find a way back. But she found the place sealed off by the police with amber patches due to a space-time fracture. With this path blocked, Olivia remembered that perhaps in this world, there was also a massive dynamic company and wondered if its director, Parallel Nina, might help her. She asked the taxi driver to take her there. The driver didn't believe she was a bad person and was more than happy to help her. They had to make a stop for gas, and that's when they ran into Lincoln, who had traced them to the station. Olivia pulled a gun on him immediately. Seeing this, Lincoln realized that Olivia's mind was indeed not running well. He was disfigured, but at least she should recognize he was sent together with her to capture the time travelers days ago. However, Olivia still didn't recognize him and locked him in the restroom. When police reinforcements arrived, Olivia took out one with a single shot. The driver exclaimed at her marksmanship, hitting the target through such a narrow gap. Olivia modestly smiled, saying she was an Olympic champion, but immediately she wondered when she had become an Olympic champion. The driver promptly pulled off the GPS from the car, saying now no one could find her. He told her he would take her where she wanted to go, and in return, she could teach him how to shoot later. The scene shifts to Parallel Dr. Walter, who was delighted watching the gas station shoot out on video, because Parallel Olivia was an excellent marksman, and the Olympic champion was her. This proved that Olivia's memories were being successfully replaced by parallel Olivia's. Later, Olivia arrived at Massive Dynamic, only to find a park instead of a building. It seemed that there was no Massive Dynamic in this parallel world at all. She began to fear being trapped in this world forever. Suddenly, an address popped up in her mind, which she remembered was a hideout mentioned by Dr. Walter, so she headed there immediately. On the way, the driver asked if Olivia had a boyfriend. She said yes, his name was Frank. But then she pondered when she started dating Frank. This Frank is actually parallel Olivia's boyfriend. The memories of the two Olivia were crossing over more and more. Upon reaching the hideout, Olivia found it to be her mother's house. She embraced her mother, unable to hide her longing. But then, she suddenly realized her mother died in a car accident when she was young, and the woman in front of her was not her mother. But the woman insisted she was her mother and challenged her how she would know this place if otherwise. Suddenly, there was a surge of electric currents in her brain. The memories of parallel Olivia completely replaced those of her own. Now, she was in real trouble. Meanwhile, in the primary world, parallel Olivia is thoroughly enjoying herself. She even gets involved with Dr. Walter's son, Peter. At that moment, the shapeshifter Newton hires some men to chisel into someone else's floor. After taking down the family, the men begin their work and find a box that looks like a music box. They decide to open it, saying that if it's a treasure inside, they'll steal it and not give it to Newton. But upon opening, they are instantly rendered stupefied, bleeding to death. The kidnapped family also dies, but another man survives, though terrified. He thought they were just digging up some stuff. How did this turn into a murder scene? So he decides to hand over the deadly music box to the police, hoping for leniency. Over at Newton's, he washes off the tattoo from parallel Olivia's neck to avoid any slip-ups. In the lab, everyone is studying the blueprint of the Doomsday Machine. Peter says Parallel Walter told him it's part of an ancient device, but no one knows who invented it. Currently, the device is incomplete with many missing parts. 
Dr. Walter has been looking for these parts. Why only Peter can start this machine is even more mysterious. Hence, Philip asks Dr. Walter to study the machine's principles, but Dr. Walter refuses, complaining it would kill too many brain cells. Meanwhile, the police discover the bodies of the people who bled to death. Parallel Olivia can't find the music box, which according to the plan should have been at the crime scene and then taken by Dr. Walter and Peter for research. She finds Newton, who says he only hired two men, both now dead so he didn't know who could have taken the opened music box. The person holding the box stares blankly at it. He's the younger brother of one of the hired men, and he doesn't know why he's unharmed. The scene flashes back to the time when Dr. Bell, though he sacrificed himself in the parallel world, left a will to Nina and Dr. Walter before his death. He left a cherished bell to Nina and a letter to Dr. Walter. The letter contains a safety deposit box key and a message saying, don't be afraid to cross the line. This was a topic they discussed in the past, with Dr. Walter always disagreeing while Bell believed in crossing the line to broaden one's horizons. Unexpectedly, Dr. Walter takes the first step. In the lab, Dr. Walter figures out how the music box kills. It emits a powerful ultrasonic wave, inaudible to humans but directly affecting the brain, leading to death. The man with the box finds Officer Olivia intending to surrender. Instead of going to the police, he wants to gauge the potential sentence and plea for leniency. Parallel Olivia discovers he's deaf, which explains his survival. She calls Newton, hands over the music box, and without hesitation kills the deaf man to silence him. As she's preparing to clean up, Peter comes knocking. Olivia quickly hides the body in the bathroom and tells Peter she just took a shower and that her stinky underwear is in there so he shouldn't go in. Peter seems upset because Dr. Walter explained why he had to cross the line to take him here from the parallel world. Peter says he understands but can't forgive him. Olivia is distracted by the blood oozing out under the bathroom door. She distracts Peter by pinning his eyes onto her sexy body. Meanwhile, Newton deliberately leaves the deadly music box on a subway station bench, telling a homeless man that he's going to the restroom and the box is empty, so he shouldn't open it. But out of curiosity like cats, the homeless man still opens it, causing everyone nearby to die, sending himself to enjoy a free home in hell. The fringe team arrives and discovers the box taken into the tunnel by the man. Peter volunteers to go and shut the box. To prevent him from being affected by the ultrasonic wave, Olivia shoots Peter in both ears, temporarily deafening him. Soon after, Peter finds the box next to the man's body and recognizes it as part of the Doomsday Machine. He saw this component in parallel Walter's blueprint. The box is damaged and can only be disassembled. Peter manages to dismantle it just in time. It appears components aren't only in parallel world. Peter and Dr. Walter decide to keep the component for further study. However, this plays right into parallel Walter's evil plan. If he alone can't figure it out, maybe two of him can. Afterwards, Dr. Walter uses Dr. Bell's key to open the safety deposit box. He discovers Bell has left the entire massive dynamic to him, making him the sole shareholder. The scene shifts to the parallel world where a freak named Milo stands by the roadside looking around. After a moment, he places a ballpoint pen on a mailbox and then walks away. As soon as he leaves, a car drives by, knocking over the pen. A bearded man sees it and plans to pick it up to shave his messy beard, but he is hit by a bicycle, causing a commotion. A curious bus driver takes a glance at the chaos and ends up running a red light, killing a pedestrian. Meanwhile, Olivia has been completely brainwashed and is officially working for the parallel world. It turns out that Walter's plot involves exploiting Olivia's unique ability to travel between two worlds to serve the parallel world. Although they already have a way to travel between two worlds, the damage it causes to the human body is too great. At this point, the Fringe Division takes over the traffic accident investigation. Oddly enough, it should have been a matter for traffic police, but why is the Defense Department involved? The mystery deepens when it is revealed that a similar traffic accident occurred at the same location the previous morning, and a ballpoint pen was found at the scene. This surprises everyone as ballpoint pens have long been outdated in parallel worlds. Moreover, all the drivers ran the red light due to distraction. With all these coincidences, the case looks less like a regular accident and more like a meticulously planned murder triggered by the ballpoint pen. Investigation reveals that the two deceased had little connection. The first victim was a man who had worked for 15 years in a hospital, while the second victim was a woman who had started working at a power company a year ago. 
The lab assistant Astrid from the parallel world calculates the probability of such events happening as zero. While discussing this, another accident occurs, and yet another ballpoint pen is found at the scene. Olivia sees Milo on an overpass. Milo drops a bicycle directly from the overpass. Olivia confronts Milo on the overpass, but he jumps off, landing on a car and escaping. It turns out the bicycle dropped earlier was to slow down this car. This indicates that Milo might have the ability to foresee the future. Olivia investigates the first two victims further and finds a connection between them. The second victim worked for a power company that had a pharmaceutical subsidiary. This subsidiary had business dealings with the hospital where the first victim worked, specifically in the treatment of the nervous system. Charlie is amazed at Olivia's deductive abilities. They go to the hospital where the victims worked and surprisingly see a vision of Dr. Walter. This triggers a deep memory in Olivia, hinting that she may awaken again soon. They learn from the hospital director that the three victims were all involved in a research project aimed at inventing a drug to treat mental illness. The drug was successful, but its effects were too strong. The fleeing Milo was one of the patients. His IQ was only 59 five months ago, but after just one treatment course, he could write out pi continuously, not from memory, but from rapid calculus calculations in his brain. After five treatment courses, Milo became a high IQ individual. It turns out the previous cases were not because he could foresee the future, but because he calculated the results. However, the director says that after five courses, patients should return to their original state since the drugs are still in the experimental phase. The three dead people were responsible for his restoration. It turns out Milo didn't want to go back to his freak self, so he killed everyone in advance who could stop him. What scares everyone is that the third victim who died hadn't received the order to restore Milo yet, but through his calculation, he knew he would. Olivia and Charlie investigate Milo's sister. It turns out she was the one who sent him for treatment, but now she regrets it. Milo left an address for his sister, saying she could find him there. Charlie suggests that since Milo can calculate how people would act, he might have deliberately lured her there. Olivia asks Astrid to try to predict Milo's actions through a computer. The computer can't calculate it. The thought process is ever-changing. He thinks the police won't go, so he goes. But you consider his thinking and go. He then thinks you'll go, so he doesn't. In the end, Olivia decides to go anyway since it's the only address they have. It turns out Milo really is there and has calculated a way to kill Olivia. He deliberately lures Olivia to a sign, where Olivia doesn't follow the standard procedure written on it to inhale oxygen, so the result is different from what Milo calculated. Olivia isn't hit by the fallen objects and manages to capture Milo. This is because in Olivia's primary world, there's no situation of oxygen deficiency, so she doesn't understand the sign and so fails to take the calculated action. With the capture of Milo, the case comes to a close. Back at home, Olivia sees a hallucination of Peter, signaling that her awakening might only be a matter of time. The scene shifts back to the primary world when parallel Olivia began to feel how hard it was to pretend to be someone else. Any slight misstep could give her away. Besides, she had to deal with various emergencies. For instance, a senator had a car accident early in the morning. This should be a matter for traffic police to handle. However, after the senator was rushed to the hospital, Newton actually planned to kidnap him. After being stopped by Philip, he simply shot the senator dead and then escaped. Upon closer inspection, Philip found that the senator was a shapeshifter. This wasn't good news as it suggested shapeshifters had infiltrated the government's high ranks. So Newton killed the senator likely out of fear of secret leakage. Dr. Walter, already the boss of Massive Dynamic, naturally had access to its high-tech laboratory. After fiddling around, he managed to make the senator's eyeballs move. He even claimed that he could restore the senator's data very soon. This left parallel Olivia dumbstruck. She was afraid her identity identity would be exposed because the shapeshifter senator knew about it. So, she hurriedly informed Newton, who brought in another shapeshifter. This shapeshifter had been in this world for five years and had assumed that the organization who sent him here had abandoned him. So, he sincerely began to live like a human, carefree and unrestrained. Newton found him, asking him to shapeshift again and infiltrate massive dynamic to extract the senator's memory stick. On the other side, Philip reported that they had blood tested all the high-ranking leaders, and currently, there were no other shapeshifters. Dr. Walter discovered that the senator reacted to a photo of his wife, so Philip directly brought his wife over. A 3D human is always better than a 2D image. With a 3D wife present, the senator's tailbone had a strong neural reflex. He suddenly woke up, yelled his wife's name a few times, and then died completely. Paralleled Olivia breathed a sigh of relief after confirming the senator was dead as shit. 
During dinner, Dr. Walter suddenly realized that having a neural reflex in the tailbone wasn't impossible, and something important might be hidden there. After all, a stegosaurus has a brain in its butt. So he excitedly planned to return to the lab for further research. However, he bumped into the shapeshifter who came for the memory stick, but he didn't choose to become Dr. Walter. Instead, he knocked him out, took the memory stick from the senator's butt, and handed it over to Newton. Newton asked him why he didn't shapeshift into Dr. Walter. The shapeshifter replied that he wanted to continue to live with his wife and child. On hearing this, Newton realized this man was beyond help as he had developed genuine feelings, so he killed him, sending him to shapeshift Jesus in heaven. Just then, Peter tracked down the shapeshifter based on surveillance and discovered Newton, so he directly captured Newton. Parallel Olivia saw that Newton couldn't escape this time, so she took the opportunity to transfer the memory stick from him. In the end, she gave Newton a self-destructive poison and then fetched Peter. She could sense that Peter was suspicious of her, so she bravely revealed herself, saying she had given every secret of her body to him and he should trust her now. Meanwhile, Newton died miserably in prison. The scene then shifts to the parallel world where Walter continues to bluff Olivia, telling her that her genes are the same as those of her counterpart in the primary world. He suggested that with some study they might understand why Olivia can traverse between the two worlds unharmed. Upon hearing that she could contribute to her world, Olivia naturally agreed. Meanwhile, someone named Matthew is cutting amber in a quarantine area with a helper. They managed to release a man from a piece of amber. This man, who was sealed by the amber for quarantine purposes, turns out to be Matthew's twin brother, Joshua. However, they are discovered soon, and the police reseal the amber, trapping Matthew and his helper inside. The law prohibits entry into the quarantine area, and stealing anything from it is even more criminal. Therefore, the Fringe team begins its investigations. The director calls for Philip and shares a secret. They tell the public that once someone is unfortunately trapped in amber, it's a death sentence. However, the truth is that these people trapped in amber are in a state of suspended animation and could potentially be saved if extracted. The concealment is to prevent people from digging out their relatives, which could lead to opposition against the government. If the crack in the amber were to be reopened, it could spread instantly. Hence, the culprit must be caught. The Fringe team reconstructs Joshua's face from the empty shell left at the scene. Upon scanning, they get all of Joshua's information. It's revealed that Joshua had used antimatter tools to rob a bank four years ago, causing a crack. The Fringe division came to patch it up, and Joshua was trapped inside. They also learn that he has a younger brother, so Olivia brings in Matthew. Matthew says he thought his brother was still sealed in the amber. He didn't care about him at all, let alone save him. He even complained that because they look exactly alike, many people thought he was the one who robbed the bank. That's why he hates his brother. Clearly, Matthew is lying. At this point, Parallel Walter plans to experiment on Olivia. Once again, they use the sensory deprivation pool. Olivia has soaked in it more than once. To their surprise, she suddenly travels to the primary world, although only for a few seconds. This excites Parallel Walter. It seems that with more research, they might solve the mystery of how she could travel between the two worlds unharmed. At home that night, Olivia sees a hallucination of Peter, who reminds her that identical twins look the same. Olivia suddenly understands. She quickly finds Philip and suspects that the Matthew they met earlier could be his twin brother Joshua, who was just rescued. Additionally, it might be Matthew, not Joshua, who robbed the bank, because they look identical. It's like one twin studying well so that both can score 100 on a test. So, Matthew is brought back to the police station. However, through fingerprint comparison, it is confirmed that this is indeed Matthew. Olivia suggests that they might have swapped again. Parallel Philip is somewhat skeptical of Olivia. When questioned, Matthew seems to know about the conversation Olivia had that morning. She insists that they've conspired their testimony and her intuition tells her she's correct. But Parallel Philip points out that she has never relied on intuition in her previous cases. This could suggest that Olivia is awakening. Philip also considers that Parallel Olivia's memories might not have been completely overwritten, so he gives her a few days off to rest at home. However, Olivia is not satisfied and decides to investigate on her own. At this point, Matthew deliberately drops a hint, saying that Joshua plans to rob a bank again, but he doesn't know which bank. Based on her judgment, Olivia asks Astrid to calculate and identify a bank. Soon after, she indeed finds a wall-piercing ring there, but is knocked out by Joshua. This device will create a crack once used, so the police rush to the scene and decide to use an amber patch in three minutes. Suddenly, Joshua appears, intending to stop Matthew. The truth finally emerges. Everything is as Olivia had thought. 
Joshua, who was rescued from the Amber, has never robbed a bank. The one who did was Matthew. After realizing his mistake, Matthew rescues his brother and intentionally robs a bank, letting the police trap him in Amber. He then lets Joshua pretend to be him and continue living. Olivia is moved by the brother's bond and decides to help Joshua keep his secret. On the way home, Olivia had another vision of Peter, who suggested that in the primary world, many experiences she had are unheard of in this world. For instance, she has a niece named Ella in her life. Now, all she needs is verification to confirm that she is actually Olivia. Hence, Olivia voluntarily asked to undergo the sensory deprivation experiment again. During the experiment, Parallel Walter also discovered that Olivia had once been tested with cortexaphin, a medicine which makes her mutate and adapt to time travel without harm. Olivia woke up in the primary world, picked up the phone, and without hesitation, called her own home. To her surprise, it was Ella who answered the call. What's more, she could remember her face. After waking from the immersion, Parallel Walter asked what she had seen. She lied, saying she saw nothing, indicating that Olivia might have returned. The scene then shifts back to the primary world, the east coast of America, where many people from different places are listening to the same radio band. Suddenly, they all fall into a sleep as if electrocuted, and upon waking, they all have amnesia. The FBI investigated the husband of one of the affected women. He explained that his wife loved listening to a numbers station, a type of radio station that is different from the ones they usually listen to. This station repeatedly broadcasted a series of mysterious numbers. They even had a group of people who listened to this station with the intention to decipher these numbers. His wife had recorded the broadcast from the night before, but she dared not study it for fear of amnesia. Nina, the director of Massive Dynamic, said that these number stations were first discovered more than 70 years ago, broadcasted in many languages. The Department of Defense had also researched them, but had never cracked the code. They didn't even know who was broadcasting these signals or where they were coming from. At this point, the police discovered that a radio transmission tower had been invaded and found a mysterious cube within. In the lab, after Dr. Walter lowered the frequency of the recording, he could finally hear it. He separated a pulse from it, which was causing people to lose their memory. The discovered cube was likely the source of the pulse. In other words, someone deliberately added this pulse to the radio transmission. But why? Peter speculated that these people were about to crack the numerical code, and to prevent the radio's secrets from being revealed, someone intervened. Dr. Walter saw blueprints of an end-of-the-world machine in the lab and knew that Peter had been researching it. He didn't want Peter to continue with his research for fear of losing him again. Elsewhere, a horse-faced man broke into a radio transmission tower and installed a mysterious cube. As a result, another group of number station listeners fell victim. It seemed he was the culprit. Peter and Parallel Olivia found his best friend, the bookstore owner, who had read many books and might know something about these mysterious radio transmissions. As expected, he mentioned that when Marconi first invented the radio, these recurring numbers were already being broadcasted. So these mysterious stations existed even before human-made radio. The owner also brought out a book from 1897 called The First People. The book mentioned that before the era of dinosaurs, there existed highly evolved humans with technology even more advanced than today's. Their calendar was different, with some months only having a few days. Surprisingly, these days corresponded to the numbers repeated on the radio. The book also mentioned that those advanced people had invented a vacuum device capable of destroying the world. At this moment, Peter found a brand new military-grade transistor in the cube, much newer than the other components. It was likely that the culprit had replaced it at the last minute. There are only a few manufacturers authorized to sell these transistors, so with a bit of investigation, they would surely catch the culprit. Meanwhile, Parallel Olivia finds the horse-faced man. It turns out they had planned this all along, transmitting amnesia to the listeners and manipulating them. She told the man that they were on the verge of getting caught. After hearing the explanation of how the crime was solved, the horse-faced man wondered how could these monkey-faced people be so smart to get to the truth. Just then, Parallel Olivia received a call from Philip. The police had traced the horse-faced man's address and asked her to go there. Looking at the situation, Olivia thought there was no hiding now. Then she confronted the horse-faced man directly, throwing him from the building and ending his horse life. Upon a glance, everyone realized that this person was also a shapeshifter. Why couldn't Dr. Walter figure out the mysterious pulse cube? It seemed that this technology also originated from the parallel universe. This suggested that Parallel Walter might know the secrets hidden within the mysterious radio signals. 
Peter had planned to extract the memory stick from the horse-faced man, only to find it broken in half. At this point, Astrid surprisingly cracked the secret of the ancient numerals. There were originally 37 coordinates spread across the globe, but there was nothing special about these locations. Dr. Walter suggested that if this message came from ancient times, then these coordinates should point to deep underground. They decided to dig at the nearest location, and sure enough, they unearthed an ancient device. Astrid discovered that one of these sites was precisely where they had previously unearthed the deadly music box. This coincidence might indicate that these coordinates are the locations of the parts of the Doomsday Machine. If so, this Doomsday Machine might be the ancient artifact referred to as the vacuum device in the ancient books. In the end, Parallel Olivia arrived at the typewriter shop, saying that she had allowed them to discover these parts as planned. It turns out all of this was still meticulously planned by Parallel Walter, who is also the defense minister. The scene shifts to the Defense Department in the Parallel World, which is surprisingly located inside the Statue of Liberty. The statue in this world is bronze, and the Doomsday Machine is right beneath it. Olivia calls the scientist, saying she's on her way and ready for the sensory deprivation experiment. But the scientist tells her there's no need to come anymore. Suddenly, Peter's hallucination appears in her mind again, telling Olivia that they are not letting her go because they've figured it out. She is no longer needed, and she'd better find a way to return to her own world. From the look in Olivia's eyes, it can be seen that she's awakened and recovered her memories. Olivia is trying to return to her primary world. She seeks the help of the taxi driver who has helped her before, hoping he can help her sneak into the Defense Department, located in the Statue of Liberty. She plans to enter the sensory deprivation tank of the Defense Department and travel back from there. The statue is on an island, so she needs to take a Tesla boat there and asks the driver to arrange one for her. Elsewhere, another paranormal case has occurred in the parallel world. So Olivia plans to solve this case before she leaves. A child has been kidnapped. How could a kidnapping case be handed over to the Fringe Division? It's shown that ever since Peter was taken away by Dr. Walter from the parallel world, kidnappings have become serious crimes handled by the Fringe Division here. Lincoln, the team leader of the parallel Fringe Division, found fingerprints of the suspect, but there were traces of sugar on them. They realize it's him. The Candyman is back. It seems this type of kidnapping case isn't the first one. Parallel Walter seeks Parallel Philip, telling him that if he can't handle this case, he'll assign it to someone else. But Philip insists on taking the case. It's then revealed that one of Philip's children had also been kidnapped by the Candyman four years ago. Although the child was released, all of his organs had aged and there was a needle puncture on the neck vertebrae. Such kidnappings occur every two years, and many children have suffered. Some of the children say there were two kidnappers, one young and one old. Olivia wants to ask Philip's son further questions, but Philip disapproves. He doesn't want his son to remember those terrible memories. Philip goes home and tells his wife about the case. In this parallel world, he's not divorced. His wife hopes that Olivia can investigate, hoping she might find the culprit who harmed their son and help save the missing child. Olivia suddenly recalls a case she handled in the primary world. The criminal extracted growth hormone from the victim's pituitary gland to suppress their own aging. The victims also had wounds on their cervical vertebrae. She deduced that the culprit in this case might have used the same theory, extracting growth hormones from children to suppress his own aging. If in that case, one side effect could be high blood sugar, hence earning him a nickname Candyman. And there might only be one culprit, who initially appeared old but later became young, explaining why the children saw both an old and a young kidnapper. In the end, Philip agrees to let Olivia come home and ask his son some questions. Meanwhile, Parallel Walter told Philip that Olivia had completed her research and was preparing to execute her the next day. On the other side, Olivia had discovered a clue from Philip's son, who told her the murderer was constantly chanting a special spell. After an investigation, they found that this spell was a doctrine from a church. Consequently, they sought the priest from the church. The reason the priest created this doctrine was that he used to be a doctor, but he failed to save his wife from SARS. He then converted to Christianity, hoping for God's forgiveness. Philip told the priest that one of his followers could be the murderer and asked for their addresses. Because his son has heard the murderer's voice, if he hears it again, he might recognize it. They split up for the investigation. Olivia arrived at the residence of a solitary young man who worked as a sanitation worker. She thought the man was highly suspicious, believing that a loner didn't have a ragdoll for children. So she killed him and found a missing child in his house, along with a complex device for synthesizing growth hormones. Seeing that, Olivia couldn't help but wonder, how could a sanitation worker understand such advanced chemistry? Did he really figure it out using his brain? 
but with the case solved, it was time for her to flee. Olivia met up with the driver at the sea as planned. The driver told her this was his first time steering a Tesla boat, but he reassured her that his brother taught him how to drive. Olivia was taken aback, and a sudden realization hit her. She hurriedly called Philip, saying the priest is the real murderer. He used to be a doctor, so he knows how to synthesize growth hormones. A sanitation worker couldn't possibly know that. She realized Philip's son was now in danger because the priest had been told that the son could recognize the murderer's voice. So she asked the driver to wait for her a little longer. At the critical moment, Parallel Philip returned home in time and sent the priest straight to meet Satan. He then found Olivia and told her that he knew she had recovered her memories, because no ordinary person could have such powerful deductive skills like her. But out of gratitude, he pretended not to know. With the help of the driver, Olivia successfully infiltrated the Defense Department's lab and returned to the primary world through the sensory deprivation tank. But she was discovered before she could even leave the supermarket. She let an ugly clerk call Peter for help as she was being dragged away and imprisoned. The scene shifts back to the primary world. Peter was having a sweet but smelly moment with parallel Olivia when he was interrupted by a call from the supermarket clerk who told him that a girl named Olivia made her call him for help as she's trapped in a parallel world. Peter was shocked and restless. After parallel, Olivia fell asleep. He began rummaging around, trying to find some evidence. When she woke up, Peter asked her a question that only the real Olivia would know. Of course, she didn't know and pretended to sleep like a pig again. When she came out of the room, she was holding a gun at Peter. She knew she had been exposed. After forcing Peter to inject himself with an anesthetic, she went to a typewriter shop to send a message to her organization, requesting extraction. Afterward, Dr. Walter and the team discussed how to rescue the real Olivia back, but without her special ability, the group couldn't travel to the parallel world safely. They then discovered that when parallel Olivia fled, she had mistakenly taken Peter's laptop, but it would take time for them to crack the password to her laptop. Meanwhile, in the parallel world, Walter and his assistant decided to use the resonance rod to exchange Olivia back. Due to the law of conservation of mass, they needed someone to replace parallel Olivia. Naturally, that would be Olivia. The question at hand was whether to send back a dead or alive person. The doctor informed Philip about this and asked him to prepare for his teammate's return. He also mentioned that they had researched the cortexophen and war was imminent. As Philip was leaving, he surprisingly saw Olivia. He asked her why she hadn't run away yet. Back in the primary world, they had decrypted parallel Olivia's computer. There was a wealth of data, most of which they couldn't understand, but they still found some clues. They discovered that she had taken a component they had dug out and found the location of the typewriter shop. Elsewhere, parallel Olivia hands over the component to the limping shopkeeper and then runs away. The FBI tracks down this shop. The shopkeeper claims innocence, saying they offered to cure his leg. That's why he helped them in exchange. He says he doesn't know anything else. Peter manages to locate parallel Olivia's whereabouts in Pennsylvania through the typewriter mold. The scene then returns to the parallel world where Philip approaches his wife, saying he has a difficult decision to make and doesn't know what to do. His wife tells him to follow his heart. Elsewhere, Olivia is strapped to an operating table. It turns out that Parallel Walter plans to extract her brain for continued research. Suddenly, Philip appears and rescues Olivia. He says he owes it to his son to save her, making him an accomplice. Olivia plans to re-enter the sensory deprivation tank. This time, with Philip's protection, there should be no one to interfere and she should be able to cross back. But the water in the tank has been drained, making it useless. He also discovers that the doctor has already synthesized the cortexophen for time travel. A thought strikes Olivia. If both doctors think similarly, there should also be a deprivation tank in Parallel Walter's lab in this world. Meanwhile, Parallel Olivia arrives in Pennsylvania and meets up with a shapeshifter, planning to cross back with his help. The shapeshifter injects three miniature resonant rods into her body. At this time, a cleaning lady stumbles upon this bizarre scene, exclaiming that these crazy days, even S&M gamers use guns to seek their pleasure. Just then, the FBI also arrives. Peter sees Parallel Olivia coming out of the bathroom, exchanges gunfire with her rather than hormones, and chases her back into the bathroom. But she emerges, taking the cleaning lady hostage. The lady's daughter is there and becomes panicked. Peter feels something is off and asks the lady what her daughter's name is. She can't answer, so he believes the lady is her accomplice shapeshifter and shoots her to death. Olivia is speechless at this display, feeling she's no match for such clever people. She begs Peter for hormone mercy, telling him that although she's a spy, they've shared a bed for many times. She confesses she has a different feeling for him. Back in the parallel world, Olivia and parallel Philip arrive at the lab's deprivation tank. 
She goes into the water again, but she hears the sound of Philip being arrested, and then suddenly, she's back in the primary world. The moment she sees Astrid, she feels so good to be alive, but she passes out and is taken to the hospital. At this time, Dr. Walter finds some rods on parallel Olivia's body. Upon checking, they are miniature resonant rods. Then, the resonant rods inside her body start to flash. Suddenly, with a loud noise, parallel Olivia in the car disappears and parallel Philip's corpse is transmitted over but missing some parts. Apparently, parallel Walter had executed the traitor, and thus, Olivia and her parallel self each return to their own worlds. In the end, the limping shopkeeper hands over the component to the shapeshifter, and his leg is cured in exchange. Later, Olivia wakes up and tells Peter that if it weren't for him, she wouldn't have courage to come back. Little did she know, Peter and her parallel self had slept together. What would she do after knowing that? That seems to be a tough question. The scene shifts to Philip granting Olivia a long vacation, urging her to take a rest. Despite having narrowly escaped death multiple times, Olivia insists on working. The world is on the brink of destruction. There's no time for her to rest. She made a promise to Philip to find a way to save both worlds without destroying one, to resolve the issue and avoid unnecessary sacrifices. Dr. Walter tells Peter about Olivia's intelligence, saying she must have guessed about his recent intimate encounters, including sleeping with parallel Olivia. Peter acknowledges the problem and promises the doctor that he will tell her when the time is right. Suddenly, a case of organ theft arises. A man's heart has been stolen. Though he is dead, his body decomposes unusually slowly. The surgical technique is too advanced for someone without medical experience. Olivia and Peter decide to investigate the deceased man's doctor, who is now in surgery. They wait, enduring an awkward silence because of their unresolved issues. Peter decides to confess to Olivia about his hormone yoga with her parallel counterpart. Surprisingly, Olivia is understanding, saying it's a manifestation of his love for her. After the surgery is done, the doctor told them that the man's stolen heart was not his own, but implanted from a girl. In the lab, Dr. Walter discovers that the body's rate of decay is almost zero because of a reagent injected into the body that halts cellular activity. This preservation technique is far superior to mummification. At home, Olivia tries to wash all the items that her parallel self used, but the task seems endless unless she moves out. She breaks down in tears like a giant baby when she finds Peter's clothes in the washing machine. After crying, she wipes her tears, pretending nothing happened. At this point, the FBI discovers multiple organ theft incidents in the past two months. Oddly, all stolen organs are not from the victims themselves, but from the same girl who donated her organs. It seems someone is recollecting the girl's organs, possibly to reassemble and resurrect her. Peter notices that none of the victims in the photos has had their cornea stolen. He hurriedly visits the potential victim's home, but it's too late. The corneas are already gone. Dr. Walter hypothesizes that the thief might genuinely be trying to resurrect the dead girl, so they must locate the girl's body. They visit the girl's mother, who reveals that her daughter was a ballet dancer suffering from depression. After unsuccessful treatments, the girl terminated herself. However, when they ask to examine the girl's remains, they find that her ashes have been replaced with sawdust. The scene changes to reveal the organ robber who has indeed been trying to revive the girl. He even strings her up like a puppet, making her perform a TikTok dance in a thrilling way. Olivia and Peter discover that a man who was part of the same therapy group as the girl stopped attending the day she killed herself. He works at a research institute dedicated to cell regeneration. The signs point to the man being the organ robber. At this time, the man indeed resurrects the girl, but now she looks pretty like a zombie. He is devastated by that outcome. Upon the fringe team's arrival, the organ robber surrenders without resistance. He admits to being in love with the girl and attempting to resurrect her after her suicide. One look into her eyes confirms that she's not the same. Olivia is devastated by the story and breaks down. Peter tries to comfort her. But Olivia says he could also know from one glance that her parallel counterpart was not the same. She admits to seeing Peter in her mind while in the parallel world, but questions why Peter cannot see that she is not the same as her parallel counterpart. Olivia accuses Peter of allowing her counterpart to take everything from her, leaving her unsure of how to proceed with him. As all this unfolds, the sorrowful observer secretly watches Dr. Walter and reports to his colleagues that the doctor is still alive, hinting that Dr. Walter might be in danger. Meanwhile, Dr. Walter is working on an experiment. He wants to invent a smart potion to restore his intelligence so he can match his parallel self. Peter urges the doctor to stop tinkering because it was him who chose to remove his own brain cells because he fears becoming like her parallel self. 
Meanwhile, in a nursing home, a man roams around aimlessly in the middle of the night. A nurse recognizes him as Joyce, a sleepwalking patient, and assumes he'll return soon. However, when another person starts chatting with him, things seem odd. The nurses rush over only to find the person has vanished. The FBI quickly arrived because the security camera caught the conversation between Joyce and his son, who died in 1985. Another camera captures the observer staying with Joyce's son. The fringe team takes the bizarre case. When Dr. Walter sees Joyce, he realizes he is his favorite band's keyboardist. Joyce claims he has no memory of the event upon waking. Philip asks Dr. Walter if they've seen a ghost. Dr. Walter responds that even if it's a ghost, it has a scientific basis in his world. He speculates that since the observer can time travel, maybe he brought Joyce's son along, meaning the son Joyce saw might have time traveled from decades ago. Anyway, they conclude that no good comes from the observer's presence. The scene switches to a group of thugs robbing a jewelry store. Suddenly, the observer appears, takes them down in a few moves, and rescues the asthmatic store clerk. He then takes her asthma inhaler. Back in the lab, Peter explains a lot, but Olivia still can't accept it. Dr. Walter hypnotizes Joyce to help him remember. He recalls his son asking him to help Dr. Walter. Dr. Walter is taken aback, but not knowing how to help, Joyce offers to play the piano for him. Dr. Walter continues his smart potion research to the sound of Joyce's music, creating a trial version with milk as the bass. Just as he's about to take a sip, the sorrowful observer appears wanting to chat. Dr. Walter asks him to tell them what will happen to their world since he can see the future. The observer says that ever since Dr. Walter saved Peter and he saved both of them, the butterfly effect has been unstoppable. The future is constantly changing and no longer predictable. For instance, after saving Peter, he caught a butterfly. This led a girl who was supposed to catch that butterfly to keep searching until nightfall without returning home. Her father went out to look for her and ended up hitting and killing a boy with his car. Incidents like these are constantly happening, disrupting both of them. Now he needs Dr. Walter's help. He instructs him to give the key to Peter and save the girl, or else everything will be over. The observer vanishes with his bald head before Dr. Walter understands anything. At this moment, Peter calls to report the jewel store robbery. Dr. Walter identifies the store clerk and urgently requests that she be brought to him. Inside the lab, Joyce was reminded of something that happened 25 years ago, the night his son died. He had called himself, talking about a dream he had where he was led by a bald man and met his future self 25 years later. Upon hearing this, Dr. Walter didn't think it was a dream, but a reality. The man Joyce had seen was indeed from that time. Joyce continued, saying that after the call, his son was killed in a car crash on his way to his concert. In his grief, he had no energy to manage the band, so he disbanded it. Listening to this, Dr. Walter finally connected the dots. It turned out that Joyce's son was killed in the car accident by the father of the girl who was catching butterflies, and the girl was the same store clerk. It seems the observer is still trying to correct all the mistakes, and the source mistake was that Dr. Walter saved Peter from the parallel world. It seemed that the observer is trying to correct this mistake today, meaning Peter might have to die. Realizing that, Dr. Walter hurriedly calls Peter, but at this moment, the car the store clerk was in got hit. The driver of the offending vehicle was none other than the observer. Olivia chased after him. Right then, the girl had an asthma attack, but her inhaler was taken by the observer. What is the observer trying to do? He had saved her earlier from the shop robbery, but now it seems that he plans to kill her. At this time, Dr. Walter rushed over. Peter asked him for the car keys, planning to help Olivia chase the observer, and asked Dr. Walter to save the girl. Dr. Walter refused to give her the car keys, saying if he did, Peter might die. But in the end, he couldn't resist and gave him the keys. Peter caught up with the observer, but was shot down. Olivia arrived to find that Peter was not dead. Everyone was confused. Peter had been shot, felt dizzy, and took an aspirin. He couldn't find water, so he swallowed it with milk from the fridge. Then he started convulsing, looking like he was about to die. Dr. Walter remotely instructed Olivia and saved him. When Dr. Walter got home, he realized that everything the observer did was actually to save him, not Peter. At the end, the two observers were talking, saying that this time Dr. Walter was willing to let Peter die. Maybe next time he could bear to kill. The observer planned to let a group of people die, but in the end, no one did. It's uncertain whether he had fixed all the mistakes in this way. The scene then shifts to the FBI having dug up components of the doomsday machine from across the world, assembling them into a rough prototype. Everyone is stunned. It's not just big, it's colossal. They have managed to piece it together, but its operation remains a mystery. Suddenly, the screen starts to flicker, and the doomsday machine stirs to life. 
It's a bewildering occurrence considering it had shown no reaction to any power source previously. Peter starts to bleed from his nose, suggesting a connection between him and the machine. But why only Peter can operate it leaves even Dr. Walter flabbergasted. The team contemplates conducting tests on Peter to understand his peculiar connection, but Dr. Walter opposes, not wanting to use his son as a lab rat. He pleads with Nina to find a way to regenerate his brain tissue so he can become smart enough to protect his son. In the lab, Philip secretly approaches Astrid for help to decode a laptop, a vestige of parallel Olivia. Despite having cracked the password, the sheer volume of encrypted files and personal diaries is daunting. Philip emphasizes that Olivia mustn't see it, fearing the revelations might upset her. After tests, they find nothing unusual about Peter, apart from a slightly elevated heart rate. Then, a peculiar case takes place. A shapeshifter is found dead, his memory chip removed. The shapeshifter's name appears in parallel Olivia's laptop files. Olivia insists on seeing the files, but Astrid dissuades her, questioning if she wishes to read her husband's intimate diaries with another person. On the other side, Nina tells Dr. Walter about a regenerative brain tissue serum that Dr. Bell had once developed. But among three vials, the labels are illegible, making identification difficult. Two of them might be for a chimpanzee and a lab rat. However, Dr. Walter dismisses the need for identification and downs one vial, boasting about his immunity to poison. At this moment, another shapeshifter, a longtime spy for Massive Dynamic, is also murdered, his memory chip similarly removed. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter exhibits chimpanzee-like behaviors while craving a banana, confirming the first serum he took was for a chimpanzee. He nonchalantly comments that he can simply excrete it or poop it out. Olivia seeks out Peter, telling him she has moved on from the past and advises him to do the same. Peter just smiles and goes out to run his errands. The scene shifts to a third shapeshifter being shot dead, but this time by Peter. The situation grows perplexing. Unable to bear being led by the nose by the killer any longer, Olivia decides to face whatever the files contain, claiming that whatever is written, she'll consider it as something she and Peter did together. After reading the files, Olivia deeply regrets her decision, as the files contain all the thoughts she has in her heart. It seems that her parallel counterpart also fell in love with Peter. Suddenly it dawns on her that if their thought processes are the same, their encryption methods might be similar too. She reveals that her nickname is Olive, and O is the 15th letter in the alphabet. Following this line of thought, she identifies Newton as the 15th name on the 15th page of the files. Since Newton is already dead, the names corresponding to the other four letters are of the dead shapeshifters, with the fourth one still alive. Without further ado, she decides to investigate further. Over at the doctor's, he finds a name list in Peter's room, which shows that circled names are those shapeshifters who got killed. Meanwhile, Peter stealthily infiltrates the home of the fourth shapeshifter intending to kill him. However, he gets discovered and is restrained. The shapeshifter says he knows Peter is the defense minister's son. He can't kill him, but he can certainly torment him. At this moment, Dr. Walter arrives, having also followed the list. Peter seizes the opportunity and kills the shapeshifter. Dr. Walter is unable to comprehend Peter's cold-bloodedness, but Peter replies that he can't let others control him, and he has to do something for himself. Dr. Walter advises him not to hide from them, expressing concern over Peter's drastic change and saying he is not himself anymore. Shortly after, Olivia and Philip arrive, but Peter and Dr. Walter have already left. Dr. Walter covers for Peter. He suggests the doomsday machine is influencing Peter, turning him into a weapon. Meanwhile, the scientist has collected three ancient books, the first people in different languages from around the world, which are the same that describe the doomsday machine. It's revealed that a few years ago, Dr. Bell was constantly looking for these books. Nina follows this clue and finds one of these books in Bell's old safe deposit box. The scene shifts to a chief scientist who receives a doll via courier, which turns out to be a trap. His face is sprayed with a bone-dissolving powder from the doll, leaving nothing but skin behind as his bones evaporate into thin air. Although the perpetrator didn't leave a return address, the police quickly find the shipping video. Peter buys Olivia a coffee, but it's written with milk on it. She usually drinks her coffee black and wonders how he could forget this. Dr. Walter analyzes the bone-dissolving powder and discovers that the particles can compress calcium matter until nothing remains. He extracts the material from the doll and suggests that it's military grade. They quickly identify the suspect via surveillance footage. It's a man named Allen, a retired soldier. Soon the FBI visits his house but can't find him. Unable to hold in her feelings, Olivia tells Peter about the coffee. 
It turns out Parallel Olivia likes her coffee with milk, and he had just gotten into the habit. The FBI indeed finds bone powder in Alan's house. It seems Alan stole them from the military. Suddenly, Alan jumps out of a window. He had been hiding all along, but he doesn't get far before a car hits him, leaving him in a vegetative state. Dr. Walter suddenly thinks of a method that might allow them to extract information from Alan's brain for their investigation, but it requires some preparation. Meanwhile, Olivia and Peter visit Alan's ex-wife. She reveals that Alan had once threatened to kill the chief scientist, and she can't believe he actually did it. It's then shown that Alan had participated in some sort of biochemical experiment while in the army. One of the scientists in charge of the experiment was the chief scientist. After returning, Alan and his wife had a child, but they lost the baby at seven months pregnancy due to bone issues. Alan believes the reckless experiments of the scientists are to blame and is determined to silence them. Dr. Walter calls, saying that he ran out of gas while driving. Apparently, he went out to find a child named Simon, who was part of a Cortexifon trial. Olivia admits she hasn't heard of him. The doctor explains that Simon developed telepathic abilities just two days after the trial started. He could read the true intentions of Dr. Walter and Bell, so they removed him from the experiment. The trio locates Simon's residence in the deep woods. He preferred to live in solitude, away from the noises of society. Interestingly, he cannot read Olivia's mind. As both of them had experienced the Cortexifon experiments, Olivia's power is higher than his. At the moment, several more people have fallen victim to the bone-dissolving powder, one of whom is also a scientist from the military's biochemical experiment. This is strange because Alan is now vegetative, so how could there be another killer? They wondered if Alan wasn't the only test subject. So Olivia, accompanied by Simon, plans to read Alan's mind. They learn the name of the project is Jellyfish, a biochemical weapons experiment. Upon further investigation, they find out that a total of three people underwent the experiment, all of whom could not have children. In compensation, the government gave them a farm. Olivia arrives at the farm and discovers the remaining two subjects are planning a massive revenge plot at an art museum. She infiltrates the scene with Simon. With their mind-reading abilities, capturing the culprits should be easy. One glance reveals thoughts filled with bone-dissolving powder and explosions. Clearly, these two are problematic. Thus, they easily kill the two men and prevent the mass murder. Simon accidentally reads Peter's mind and passes a note to Olivia. On the other side, Nina is studying several ancient books that she obtained about the first people. She discovers the content of the books is identical, only the author's names are different. When she combines all the author's names, a familiar name emerges. It's Dr. Sam, the one who treated Olivia using a shoelace method. Considering these books describe prehistoric civilizations, just how old is Sam to know about these things? Nina seeks him out. Dr. Sam says Peter is the only person whose frequency harmonizes with the doomsday machine. Only he can control this machine, which has both destructive and creative effects. It all depends on Peter's choice. If he chooses Olivia, our world will be safe. Conversely, if he chooses her parallel counterpart, then it will be a disaster. Nina says there's no problem, Peter will surely choose Olivia. Sam gives a knowing smile and asks if she is sure. At the end, Olivia returns home and opens the note Simon gave her. It reads, Peter still has a feeling for her. Olivia realized a love triangle is officially formed. The scene shifts to parallel Olivia from the parallel world going to the airport to pick up her boyfriend Frank, who has returned from a several months long business trip. They hug and kiss without using their juicy tongues, happily returning home. Frank mentions that Olivia seems somewhat distant towards him, but Olivia brushes it off, blaming it on being too busy at work. At this moment, a bizarre case occurs. A man's body hatches many bugs and dies horrifically in a restroom. The bugs die as soon as they emerge. It seems that the planet isn't suitable for their survival. Parallel Olivia and Frank still don't know that Parallel Philip is dead. It seems Parallel Walter is hiding this fact. Therefore, Lincoln temporarily takes over the Fringe Division. Meanwhile, Parallel Walter begins the Cortexifen experiment, but discovers that adults vaccinated with it die quickly, so the assistant suggests trying it on children. But the doctor rejects this, insisting they won't use children. 
Charlie and Olivia go to consult an entomologist for the case investigation, but the lady falls in love with Charlie at first sight, constantly staring at him as she speaks. She examines the bugs from the crime scene and identifies them as a type of killer beetle that can only parasitize sheep. But sheep, as a species on this planet, went extinct 10 years ago. In other words, these beetles should have gone extinct with the sheep. Elsewhere, a mad scientist is trying to extract an enzyme from the beetle, but it seems to fail. He appears to be the culprit who cultivated the parasite. Olivia returns to headquarters and finds Frank there. He works at the CDC and has come to assist with the investigation. Frank secretly tells Lincoln a secret, asking him to keep it confidential. Lincoln assures him that he can keep a secret. It turns out Frank plans to propose to parallel Olivia over the weekend. But Lincoln immediately tells Olivia, leaving her somewhat at a loss. At this moment, the Fringe team discovers a scientist who has dedicated many years to studying the killer beetle and resigned a few years ago. His colleague says he was devastated when the last sheep died. At the moment, the mad scientist has killed another person, leaving behind a basket full of beetles. The Fringe team discovers that the beetles appear to be slightly larger this time, and their vitality has also increased. Meanwhile, Parallel Walter surprisingly has a mistress. As they snuggle in bed, he confesses that despite all his calculations, he never expected Peter to fall in love with Olivia from the primary world. He believes Peter won't return to the parallel world due to this attachment. When Parallel Olivia arrives home, Frank reveals that he has investigated the mad scientist who has dedicated his life to researching a vaccine for avian influenza. A crucial ingredient in the vaccine is an enzyme found in these beetles. However, even after the extinction of sheep, the scientist failed to develop the vaccine. It seems he hasn't given up and continues his experiments on humans. Frank questions whether this is a deed of evil or good. Suddenly, Frank pulls out a ring and proposes to Olivia. She wonders why he proposed earlier, but eventually agrees. At this time, the Fringe team discovers that the mad scientist rented a warehouse six months ago. This must be his secret research base. So Lincoln and Olivia head to the location. Unfortunately, the clueless Lincoln gets locked into a cold storage room. Meanwhile, Olivia gets caught and is fed an unknown liquid, possibly for the experiments. Lincoln escapes by cooling the lock with liquid nitrogen. The mad scientist claims that he's about to acquire the beetles he needs and that the successful development of the vaccine could save millions. He believes the death of a few people is a small price to pay. Olivia argues that she shouldn't be included in that count. At this moment, Lincoln appears and subdues the mad scientist. Olivia feels a sudden churn in her stomach. The beetles are about to emerge. They rush her to the hospital. On the way, the mad scientist reveals that the liquid he gave her was plain water and she isn't infected. Still, why does she feel nauseous? Upon examination, she's found to be pregnant. The mad scientist removes a beetle from his neck and tells Lincoln to remember his name because he's about to become famous. After saying this, he dies. In the hospital room, Frank asks Olivia if she loves the father of her child. Given his absence over the past few months, the child can't be his. It must be Peter's. Parallel Olivia doesn't respond and Frank leaves in a huff. The happiest person at this moment is Parallel Walter, who exclaims Olivia is carrying his grandchild and he bets Peter will come back. The scene shifts back to the primary world where a group of people are killing themselves by jumping off a building one after the other. Peter observes the situation and finds it strange that furniture is also being thrown. Upon questioning the locals, they claim that the building is haunted and half the occupants have already left. Dr. Walter and Peter go to the balcony and discover that the people are jumping off from directly below. How are they managing to jump and then turn? The doctor suspects that a rift between the two worlds is causing this, and the parallel world probably doesn't have a balcony. Somehow, their own world has been replaced by the parallel one. That group of people were partying on the balcony when it suddenly disappeared, causing all of them to fall. Dr. Walter plans to find a device to verify his theory and asks Olivia and Peter to stay nearby. It's below freezing, so they decide to visit a bar. Olivia confesses that she knows Peter is happy with her parallel self and wants to experience it too. She asks for a kiss. As Olivia opens her eyes, she is startled as Peter is glowing. She explains that when she's scared, objects from the parallel world glow. She confesses her fear that their relationship won't be able to recover. She advises that when one is sad, they should look up to prevent tears from falling. 
As Olivia looks up, she sees no tears, but a room starts to glow in the haunted building. When Olivia came over, he found an old woman conversing with the spirit of her deceased husband. The woman recounted that a few months ago, during a power outage at home, she and her husband had decided who would fix the issue through a coin toss. Unfortunately, her husband was electrocuted in the process. Several days later, she started seeing his apparition. Dr. Walter clarified that it wasn't a ghost, but her husband from a parallel world. Olivia's ability to see this was normal. However, if the old woman, a typical person, could also see it, it indicated that the barrier between the two worlds was very thin at this point. If left unchecked, the first patch in their world would be born. So Dr. Walter gathered top scientists from Massive Dynamic to research the amber bomb. Philip warned that misuse could trap civilians too. But Dr. Walter retorted that if not used, half the city would vanish. So why could only the old woman see the parallel world? Dr. Walter proposed a theory of quantum entanglement. Two distant individuals, if emotionally intensely connected, could sense each other. The crack was open due to the old couple's mutual longing. Just then, a quantum vibration was produced in the haunted building, showing that the crack might be forming. The FBI began evacuating the crowd, preparing to set up the amber bomb to patch the crack up. Upon hearing this, the residents, not particularly fond of living in a haunted building, were thrilled at the prospect of their building being blown up. However, the old woman refused to leave. Olivia and Peter tried to persuade her, but she wouldn't listen. It turned out that in the parallel world, it's the woman who had lost the coin toss and died, rather than her husband. The emotional bond between the two was growing so intense that even Philip could see the light. Just as they were about to detonate the amber bomb, the old man from the parallel world declared that their children missed her too. Upon hearing this, the woman realized he wasn't her husband, as they never had children in this primary world. The old woman finally let go, and the world returned to normal. Dr. Walter said he could now understand how his parallel counterpart chose to do so. Some things were indeed helpless. In the end, Olivia realized it had been her all along interfering with her relationship with Peter. To break the stalemate, Olivia kissed Peter and headed to a fishy hormone yoga session. The scene then flashes back to the time right after Dr. Walter rescued Peter from the parallel world. One day, while his wife was cleaning, she found a note from Peter saying he wanted to go home. Peter knew he didn't belong to this primary world. He remembered crossing over from Lake Ryden and thought there might be another world at the bottom of the lake. So he tied himself to a rock and sank, hoping to return to his real home. He was reluctantly rescued by Dr. Walter's wife. In another scene, Dr. Walter gathered a group of children for a cortexophon experiment. The blonde girl was Olivia. Dr. Walter's wife brought Peter along. The doctor explained that Peter was suffering from a serious brain illness and had a fever of 45 degrees, which had confused him. He assured Peter that they were his real parents. Peter dismissed this as nonsense and went to bed. The doctor couple was living a miserable life. They felt guilty for breaking up someone else's family, and Peter didn't trust them at all. They thought life would have been easier if they hadn't saved him, so they decided to send Peter back to the parallel world, which initiated the research on the cortexifon drug for time travel. In another scene, Olivia was being abused by her stepfather at home when she suddenly crossed over to the parallel world for a few seconds. The next day she told Dr. Walter, indicating the cortexifon he developed was working. The doctor's wife took Peter out to distract him. They passed a field of tulips. She explained that a scientist paid efforts and had made it possible to grow tulips in this barren land. This reference to tulips, which first appeared in season two, was fully explored. Dr. Walter once asked God for a white tulip as a sign of forgiveness. Thus, the white tulip represented a beautiful outcome despite changed circumstances. After visiting a toy store, they visited Dr. Walter. Peter's mood improved significantly, and it was the first time he met Olivia. They shared a smile. Since the initial success, Dr. Walter has custom-made many systematic experiments for Olivia. He believes some potent emotion drives her to shuttle between two worlds. He has tested joy, excitement, anger, and loneliness, but all with no response. In the end, he locked her in a dark room and played Daniel C.C. horror movies for her. As a result, she set the room on fire. 
Then, Olivia disappeared without a trace. Dr. Walter suspected she had crossed into the parallel world. While wandering around the house, Peter discovered Olivia's sketchbook. Many of the drawings were impure, such as a grimacing stepfather and so forth. Only the field of tulips seemed exceptionally beautiful. Dr. Walter believed that Olivia's ability to ignite energy was not just due to fear, but a tangled emotion of fear and love. Meanwhile, in the parallel world, Parallel Walter is drinking in silence. At this time, he has also become the lead figure responsible for the Department of Defense. Therefore, his son Peter's kidnapping made the headlines. He's very distressed. He's responsible for the safety of the entire country, yet he can't even protect his own family. The incident was too bizarre. He made many guesses, thinking that someone had disguised themselves to look like him and committed the crime, even suspecting aliens. As a result of Peter's disappearance, the couple's relationship became a bit strained. This could also be a hint at parallel Walter's infidelity and ultimately finding a mistress. Peter finds Olivia in the tulip field. Olivia is stunned, unsure how he could find her here. It turns out Olivia was hiding here for two reasons. The first was naturally the violence from her stepfather. The second was that she thought she had messed up the experiment and Dr. Walter would be unhappy. Peter advises her to try and do something and maybe a change will be better. This is also a hint at the white tulip. From this moment, Olivia decided to make some changes. Why don't they remember being so close when they were children? This hasn't been revealed yet. Upon her return, Olivia sought out Dr. Walter and finally voiced her inner pain. She also gave him her sketchbook. But all this happened in the parallel world where Olivia unconsciously crossed over. The one she spoke to was Parallel Walter. After that, Dr. Walter told Olivia's stepfather, warning him if he dared bully Olivia again, he would make sure he paid. Peter finds Dr. Walter's wife and says he won't run around anymore. He now believes he belongs to this world, but she is not his real mom. That's really hurtful. In the end, Dr. Walter, looking at Olivia's drawings, realizes who took Peter away and vows to rescue him back. After the flashes, the scene shifts back to the present. Dr. Walter visits Dr. Bell's former office. He moves a pile of items, many of which were materials from their shared research. This sparks a sense of nostalgia in Dr. Walter for Bell. Elsewhere, two thieves are caught stealing from a metal warehouse. Strangely, one thief is shot by the police and appears to ascend directly to heaven. Could this be a divine intervention? Meanwhile, Peter is tinkering with the parts of a doomsday machine in his lab when he receives a call from Olivia inviting him to the park. Reluctantly, Peter agrees. However, their plans are disrupted by the unfolding case. Dr. Walter is astounded by the technology that allows a person to float to heaven with ease. The police find a key card in the thief's pocket, but the security claims it doesn't belong to their warehouse. So, an investigation by the Fringe team ensues. They discover the target warehouse from where a large amount of a metal, the heaviest element on Earth, has gone missing. This element is not rare and is inexpensive, making the theft puzzling. Elsewhere, the escaped thief seeks help from a white-haired scientist, but the thief's condition worsens, bleeding from his orifices, and he soon dies to meet his ancestor. In the lab, Dr. Walter notices that the floating body regains weight and falls, becoming unusually heavy. He can't explain why, even with his expertise. After investigating the keycard found on the thief, they locate a warehouse where Olivia and Peter rush to check, only to find a room full of deceased individuals. The cause of death appears to be an overdose of the same metallic element in their blood. They also find numerous wheelchairs. After performing autopsies, Dr. Walter discovers that all the victims suffered from leg atrophy and couldn't walk, leading to a hypothesis that they willingly participated in the white haired scientist's research. After all, who would refuse a chance to walk again? Meanwhile, the white-haired scientist watches his son play ball. His son, too, suffers from leg atrophy and is bound to a wheelchair. It seems that all the scientist's experiments are an attempt to help his son walk again. In his lab, Dr. Walter struggles to understand the situation. When Nina stops by to deliver materials, he mentions that if Dr. Bell was here, they could solve this together. 
He recalls that Bell had researched soul magnets, a concept of transferring consciousness to another place, ensuring the brain survives even after death. Dr. Walter asks whether Bell had succeeded before he died, but Nina believes it's impossible. The white-haired scientist finds another volunteer, injects him with something, and the volunteer begins to fly like a chicken. To prevent him from flying away, they equip him with heavy boots and state that more metal is needed to sustain this state. If they run out, they'll have to steal more. The young volunteer, excited about his newfound ability to fly, eagerly volunteers for the task. Back in the lab, Dr. Walter discovers that the blood of these floating people contains two different kinds of elements, including the first one. He is baffled, as both these two elements are incredibly heavy and are unlikely to form a new molecule, let alone cause levitation. The newly found element primarily comes from meteorites. The largest amount of it in Boston is stored in the Astronomical Museum. Meanwhile, the white-haired scientist and the young man are indeed at the museum, planning to steal the rare element, but they're caught red-handed by the police. Dr. Walter questions the scientist about how he achieved the levitation. The scientist explains it was an accident. He is an aerospace scientist. While creating an alloy, he accidentally discovered that mixing these two elements forms a molecule lighter than hydrogen. He wanted to further improve this method to help his son walk again. Dr. Walter is feeling uneasy, so he seeks out Nina. He speculates that the impossible chemical event they are witnessing is a consequence of opening the doors between two worlds. They are retracing the steps of the parallel world, and many physics and chemistry phenomena are subtly changing. He is afraid that even more illogical events may occur in the near future. His brain alone isn't sufficient to handle this. He urgently needs to revive his genius partner, Dr. Bell. Upon hearing this, Nina chides him, believing he is joking. But Dr. Walter insists that there must be a trigger to bring back Bell's soul energy. He suddenly remembers a pair of bells, rings them, and for a moment thinks that Dr. Bell has possessed Nina. Unfortunately, she seems unaffected. On the other side, Peter tells Olivia that he's working on a doomsday machine and asks her to keep it a secret. As they chat, Olivia's tone shifts, sounding like Dr. Bell. Indeed, Bell has taken over Olivia's body, much to everyone's surprise. Now Olivia's acting skills are put to the test. Dr. Bell assures everyone not to worry. He will only remain in Olivia's body for 48 hours before her consciousness expels him. During this time, they need to find another body to transfer his spirit. Olivia is fine, so everyone should relax. All of this is due to the soul magnet that Bell purposefully placed in the tea Olivia drank when she first met him at the end of season one. Everyone, including Bell himself, is disoriented except for Dr. Walter. Bell seems to be an old flirt and have taken a liking to the lab assistant Astrid. The scene shifts to a chubby man who is planning to end his chubby life while a blonde woman tries to console him using her words first but muscles later. As they embrace, they both jump off a building in a tragic and dramatic scene. Surprisingly, the woman survives the fall, dusts her butt off, and walks away. The FBI watches the video, perplexed. They argue that surviving such a fall unscathed is impossible. Dr. Walter looks worried, but Bell, in Olivia's body, instantly guesses what he's thinking, asking if he believes this is due to spatial decay. However, when Dr. Walter and Bell arrive at the scene, they find no evidence of spatial decay. At that moment, an agent arrives to assist them with the case. It's Lincoln from the primary world. He reveals that the blonde woman was a victim in one of his previous cases. Her entire family was killed by a home intruder. However, her body mysteriously disappeared a few days later. Peter suggests they've found her now, and not only that, but she's also alive. Inside the lab, Dr. Walter and Bell have been studying the blood left at the scene by the blonde woman. They discover that the molecules in her body have been magnetically aggregated. Peter and Lincoln visit the blonde woman's previous workplace, a center for the treatment of suicidal depression. Her colleagues say she's a good person, able to save more than 30 people a month. It's strange for her to choose to jump off a building with another person. They also mention she's been struck by lightning twice and survived. Could this be the reason for her invincibility? Elsewhere, the blonde woman is visiting another person with suicidal tendencies. The young man declares his heart is dead. No matter how much she tries, she can't persuade him. What's more, he has planted a bomb on a train. He gives the location to her and then ends his life. It's one thing to die, but why involve so many innocent people? 
Inside the lab, Dr. Walter and Bell discuss potential hosts for Bell's consciousness while casually smoking. Surprisingly, Bell considers using the body of a dairy cow. Dr. Walter objects, saying he would feel it disgusting to milk him for breakfast. Bell then suggests that Astrid could help with the milking. After hearing about the blonde woman's lightning strikes two times, Dr. Walter hypothesizes that the intense electromagnetic energy could have disrupted her body's electromagnetic field, possibly making her invincible. The police searched the house of the young man who killed himself and found he had made a bomb. Meanwhile, the blonde woman is on the bomb rig train, nonchalantly sitting on top of a bag of explosives found under a seat. Lincoln speculates she's on a suicide mission. As her entire family is dead, she might want to follow suit, but her invincibility prevents her from dying, which could explain why she wants to die with others. The police manage to track down her phone. Peter calls, but she refuses to listen. From the sound of the moving train on the call and a quick cross-reference with the train timetable, they are able to pinpoint the train. The police intercept the train, but the blonde woman escapes with the bomb. As they discuss, a mushroom cloud rises in the distance. They find her dead as shit at the explosion site. The group was dumbfounded by her death, thinking, how is that possible for an invincible person? That night, as Peter and Belle are talking, a distant bell tolls and Olivia returns to her senses, only to revert back to Belle within seconds. Belle exclaims that this is bad, leading Peter to worry that Olivia might not come back. The group attempts to transfer Belle's consciousness to a brain-dead body, but the attempt fails. Belle is rushed to the hospital due to convulsions. Afterward, Belle admits that Olivia's consciousness is too weak to expel his out of her sexy body. The only way to save her is to enter her consciousness and guide her back, while simultaneously transferring Belle's consciousness to a computer. Their reasoning is that brain waves are electromagnetic energy, which can be transferred to a computer. They usually use computers to monitor electromagnetic energy anyway. To enter someone else's consciousness, they must take a large dose of hallucinogens. With Philip leaving behind to observe them, Peter takes the first dose and the three of them enter Olivia's consciousness. Inside Olivia's consciousness, Peter and Dr. Walter first meet near Massive Dynamic. They plan to go there first to find Belle. Suddenly, Olivia's stepfather appears in her consciousness, and everyone begins to attack Peter and Dr. Walter. This is Olivia's unconscious self-defense mechanism. When they go to Belle's office at Massive Dynamic and open the door, they find Belle has turned into a cartoon character. The following sequence suddenly turns into a cartoon version. Belle suggests that Olivia has hidden herself and he doesn't know where to find her. Peter declares she is his girlfriend, and he knows where her smelly body hides. Philip accidentally ingests a hallucinogen. What he sees is unknown, but he acts like a fool. The trio plan to leave on the rooftop's Kirov airship, but are attacked by zombies. It's just a dream. Anything can happen in the dream world. They encounter a man with an X on his big chest on the airship. He punctures the airship. Dr. Walter is accidentally sucked out and falls from the sky. He wakes up. Now only Peter and Bell continue the mission. In the lab, Dr. Walter begins to prepare the computer for transfer. Philip hallucinates a fat bird flying around and starts playing with it. Dr. Walter gives him a glance, noting his low tolerance. Peter rides a motorcycle with Bell to a military camp where Olivia used to serve. She once told Peter that this was the best place for a peaceful life, so he believes Olivia must be there. Her biological father painted the door red, which was easy to find. Peter walks in and sees Olivia. There's also a family eating dinner. This must be Olivia's childhood. Peter looks at her and says she has a strange light in her eyes, so she is not Olivia. Sure enough, the real Olivia disguised herself as a little girl. Then her stepfather came chasing after them with a team. Peter wakes up from a car crash. Now only Belle is left to continue the mission. At the critical moment, Olivia reaches out to stop her father and his group, saying she used to live in fear under his shadow. From now on, she won't be afraid of him anymore. Belle says this is the real reason he came. Transferring to a computer is nonsense, and the technology isn't feasible. He urges her to leave. So Olivia's consciousness successfully returns to reality. Philip blows bubbles to warmly welcome her. Dr. Walter also knew that Belle was talking nonsense. He only held a little hope at the beginning. This time, Belle might really be gone. Only Dr. Walter is left. After this incident, Olivia changes. Their relationship has also improved a lot. Olivia draws a picture of the man with the X on his big chest. When asked who this mysterious figure is, Olivia says she doesn't know. She's never seen him before. The scene then shifts to the parallel world where parallel Olivia's pregnancy is now public knowledge. But there's a lethal problem. 
In this world, Olivia's sister died of a disease called viral seizure, which could cause maternal and infant death during childbirth. The likelihood is high. Her sister died while giving birth to Ella. Moreover, this disease is hereditary, so parallel Olivia has a chance of getting it. This means the child may not survive the birth. A test is needed. But at this time, parallel Olivia is abducted. The parallel fringe division quickly finds out about Olivia's mysterious disappearance. She has a biological GPS chip in her body. Lincoln leads a team to track it, but the chip has been removed. Elsewhere, Olivia is tied to a hospital bed by a group of people. They inject her, give her medicine, and shine a strange ray on her stomach. What are they trying to do? Even Olivia is confused about what they are trying to do to her. At this time, Astrid has discovered a taxi that has been lurking outside Olivia's house every day. The probability of this happening is nearly zero. So Lincoln and Charlie rush over. It turns out it's the same taxi driver who initially helped Olivia escape. He tells them everything he knows. He also asks why Olivia returned after escaping and why she doesn't seem to recognize him. He gives many details, which are hard to disbelieve. Lincoln and Charlie are puzzled, thinking there must be a problem. Olivia's mother receives a call from the doctor. It's bad news saying that Parallel Olivia also has viral seizures. Lincoln finds the defense minister, Parallel Walter. He's the only one who can explain everything. As a result, Walter explains everything, including that the child Olivia is carrying is Peter's. But he does not mention the death of Philip. He says he gives Lincoln more authority and he must find Olivia out. Meanwhile, Olivia is still being prodded on the hospital bed, but her stomach suddenly becomes larger. It seems these people want Olivia to give birth to the child and have accelerated the pregnancy process. Olivia thinks she can't be manipulated like a lab rat, so she escapes, but soon starts to have contractions. She's about to give birth. She hastily called Lincoln. The driver said it's too late, but he could take her out through a shortcut. After the driver and Lincoln arrived as quickly as possible, they settled Olivia in a shop, prepared to give birth right then and there. The driver said he was familiar with delivery because he delivered all his children at home for the sake of saving money. Olivia protested that she couldn't give birth if she did, both she and her child might die. Lincoln thought she was scared, so he confessed his feelings. In the end, the driver successfully delivered the baby. It's a boy, and Olivia survived too. It was truly a miraculous stroke of luck considering the odds. The nurse drew blood from the baby's heel and handed it over to Parallel Walter. It turns out the abduction of Olivia was orchestrated by him. He did it to cure her, ensuring she could safely give birth because he intended to extract from the child's DNA and synthesize a gene similar to Peter's. He speculated that he might not need Peter to switch on the doomsday machine that could destroy the other world, thus preserving his own. In other words, he was willing to sacrifice his own son. The scene shifts back to the primary world, which begins to experience various strange natural phenomena, such as sheep refusing to go home, locusts infesting, and even storms and lightning. Dr. Sam noticed that the bowling ball could vibrate on its own without any external force. His resonating ball also began to sway on its own. Something big was about to happen. However, Peter and Olivia were still in bed. One call from Philip brought them all together. Dr. Walter was perplexed. Even if something was about to happen, it shouldn't be this intense. At this point, Nina made an urgent call, saying the doomsday machine had switched itself on. This was truly strange, because Peter was hundreds of miles away from the machine, yet it moved on its own. They had to wonder if the previous theories were wrong. In the lab, Dr. Walter speculated there might be a doomsday machine in the parallel world, which was activated and thus affected the primary world due to quantum entanglement. The strange phenomena became more frequent and severe. In the parallel world, the parallel fringe team detected quantum vibrations at the Department of Defense, but when they arrived, they were ordered to retreat. Wanting to know what was going on, Olivia met the defense minister. It turned out Parallel Walter had indeed used the genes of her child to drive the machine, planning to destroy the primary world. However, it was not perfect and required further research. Olivia was puzzled, wondering if there is a way that causes no harm to anyone. Dr. Walter's reply showed there was no better way out. Back to the primary world, Peter brought his father, saying since he can start the machine, he should be able to stop it. But Dr. Walter disagreed to let him try, saying if it didn't work, it could cost lives. But indeed, there was no better solution. As the world was about to end, Nina told Olivia that there might be one person who could help, and that was Dr. Sam. But his bowling alley was closed, and he was missing. 
In the parallel world, after Olivia got her child to sleep and left him with Lincoln, she planned to do something significant, to bring back Peter, the child's father. He was the only person who could make the defense minister change his mind, as he was once taken to the primary world by the minister. Therefore, she stormed into the lab and threatened the chubby assistant to reveal the method of crossing worlds. The assistant warned that the method was unstable and harmful to humans. However, Olivia was desperate and didn't care about the risks to see Peter. But she didn't seem to know how to use it and was caught before she could activate it. Back to the primary world, Dr. Walter sought the help of Philip, finally agreeing to let Peter attempt to shut down the machine. Peter, who should have died 25 years ago, hoped for a powerful energy wave to end his life, sparing him further suffering. Meanwhile, Olivia went in search of Dr. Sam. Seizing the opportunity of her absence, Peter hurried to test the machine, knowing she would undoubtedly disapprove. After bidding farewell to everyone, Peter stepped towards the gateway of hell, only to be shocked by the machine the instant he touched it. He was rushed to the hospital. After an examination, Peter was found to be physically fine, but remained unconscious. Dr. Walter sought God, reminiscing about a white tulip once given to him as a sign of forgiveness. He had changed, ready to sacrifice Peter, but he wondered why their world was still not forgiven. Just then, Dr. Sam appeared, urging Olivia to bring him to the Doomsday Machine immediately. Meanwhile, disastrous weather became increasingly frequent, with even lightning storms occurring. Olivia brought Sam to the Doomsday Machine and questioned why the machine, which only Peter can operate, had self-activated without Peter's intervention. Sam couldn't explain it clearly. Even if it was due to quantum entanglement, how would the machine in the parallel world have activated? Little did they know it was activated by using Peter's child's blood. Sam casually threw a pen at the machine, which was promptly repelled. He explained that the machine had a self-protection function and mistook that Peter had entered inside, thus blocking all nearby objects. Sam mentioned a lever mentioned in the book, which is needed to pry open the machine's force field to allow Peter to enter again. This lever was locked in a box, which required an ancient key to open. Olivia questioned Sam's identity, asking if he had written the book, The First People. It turned out that the manuscript of the book had been passed down through Sam's ancestors for generations. Once they had the box, all they needed was the key, which was stored in the city center museum as a historical artifact. Meanwhile, Dr. Walter and Astrid conducted experiments in the lightning storm, constantly recording the frequency and location of the lightning strikes in hopes of understanding something. At this time, Peter woke up, but seemed to be in a daze, even struggling to remember his own name. He hailed a cab to New York. Dr. Walter and Astrid discovered a certain pattern in the location and frequency of the lightning. They noticed that lightning was striking the same spot repeatedly. This pattern was strangely similar to magnetic field lines, with one center located at the machine and another at the Statue of Liberty in New York. Hence, Dr. Walter hypothesized that in the parallel world, the Doomsday Machine was placed inside the Statue of Liberty, which was also the Defense Department in that world. He requested Philip to move the machine to New York, hoping that overlapping the two might alleviate the impending crisis. Meanwhile, Sam and Olivia entered the museum and retrieved the fossil slab containing the key. The museum had already been ravaged by lightning, so taking one artifact didn't seem to matter. They used the key to open the box, but instead of a lever, there was a small portrait inside. First it was Peter's, and now it's Olivia's. After some research, Dr. Walter quickly came up with the answer. He explained Olivia must be the lever, and the lever referred to her two special abilities, telekinesis and the ability to travel between two worlds. Therefore, she needed to use her telekinesis to control the machine in the parallel world, allowing Peter to enter the machine in the primary world and shut it down. Olivia found this task daunting, but gave it a go. However, after several attempts, she failed. Suddenly, a call came in from the hospital saying that Peter had disappeared. Meanwhile, Peter had already arrived in New York. He bought a coin at a pawn shop, a toy he used to play with when he was young. He then went to the Statue of Liberty demanding to see the defense minister. As a result, he was detained by the police. It seemed his mental state wasn't quite right. When Philip and the others heard the news, they rushed over. Thankfully, Peter gradually returned to normal. Meanwhile, the machine was operating more intensely. Philip urgently cleared the area, hoping to save as many people as possible. With time running out, they had to brace themselves and proceed. Encouraged by Peter, Olivia closed her eyes, and when she opened them again, the machine's force field had indeed disappeared. She succeeded in controlling the machine in the parallel world. Now, it was all up to Peter. 
Peter stepped up, closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, he found himself lying in the middle of the street, wounded all over, and was promptly rushed to the hospital. Unexpectedly, he found himself in the year 2026. He had traveled 15 years into the future. His memories synced with this world, and the recent events became mere memories. In the future, the primary world had established its own department of quantum science, and Olivia's niece, Ella, had become an agent. The explosion from the previous night was deemed a terrorist attack, with the world's number one terrorist claiming responsibility. The number one terrorist placed two explosive devices in a theater, intending to leave nothing behind. However, one of the bombs turned out to be a dud. Peter took it back to study, but after spending most of the day, he still couldn't figure it out. The only option left was to let Dr. Walter have a go at it. However, Dr. Walter was in prison in this future world. It turns out, even though Peter had stopped the Doomsday Machine, he had destroyed another world. In theory, the primary world should be getting better, but it was still deteriorating day by day. So someone had to pay for this to appease public anger. Naturally, that was Dr. Walter who was in charge of all these experiments. In the prison, Peter met Dr. Walter, who pointed out that it was impossible to understand the bomb while in prison. Therefore, Peter requested Philip to temporarily transfer Dr. Walter back to the lab for a few days. In the future, Peter and Olivia were married, but they had no children. They were too busy to start a family. In another scene, the number one terrorist created a bigger explosive device for the next attack, and his boss was none other than Parallel Walter from the Parallel World. It turned out that when Peter stopped the Doomsday Machine, he directly destroyed the Parallel World. Parallel Walter managed to jump back at the critical moment, waiting for a chance to take revenge. During an investigation, Peter discovered a box and secretly pocketed it. It seemed he knew what it was. Peter rushed to his father's villa by the Ryden Lake and opened the box. Inside was the key to the villa. Parallel Walter was waiting inside for Peter to arrive. He deliberately left the key for Peter. He believed he did nothing wrong and couldn't understand why a person who first caused destruction and then stole his son was winning. This war wasn't started by him. All his unwillingness was for revenge. He even threatened to kill Olivia. Meanwhile, Olivia was investigating a wormhole crack incident in the park. This wormhole was different. It was a space-time crack, meaning travel through time and space was possible through it. Peter told Parallel Walter that he won't let him succeed and prepared to handcuff him. However, this was only a holographic projection. The real Parallel Walter appeared in front of Olivia and shot her, ending her sexy life. Olivia's funeral followed, and everyone was immersed in grief. Dr. Walter was full of regret, saying that the doomsday machine wasn't a life-saving pill at all. Even though it destroyed the parallel world, the primary world did not survive. It seemed that the two worlds were interdependent. If one was gone, the other would follow. If he could go back, he would never let Peter destroy the other world. Suddenly, he realized what was happening. He hurriedly found Peter and told him it was not too late. He still had a chance to save both worlds. They could start all over again. This puzzled Peter greatly. There was one question they never figured out. Where did the doomsday machine come from, and why was it buried deep in the ground for millions of years? Dr. Walter said that he actually sent the doomsday machine back through the space-time wormhole, which is why only Peter and Olivia could influence it. He had simulated their future world into the machine beforehand so Peter could see it. If Peter had a prior judgment, he would make different choices. He once again reminded Peter the two worlds are interdependent and urged him to start it all over. After the future scenes fed by the machine, the story returns to the regular timeline. Peter has only been up there for a minute before the machine in the parallel world begins to operate. Parallel Walter knows that Peter is driving the machine on the other side. He quickly brings Parallel Olivia, telling her she is in the picture too, and asking her to try and stop the machine. But Parallel Olivia responds, that is not her, it's the Olivia from the primary world. At this moment, Peter wakes up, knowing what he has to do. Suddenly, the people and objects from the parallel world appear here. Peter has opened a gateway between the two worlds, right in this room. As the two sides are about to clash, Peter quickly explains that if one world is destroyed, both will perish. The true function of this doomsday machine is not to destroy, but to peacefully open the gateway between the two worlds. The first people mentioned by the book also refers to Dr. Walter. He is the one who sent this machine from the future. Therefore, the gap that was opened is a platform for the two worlds to heal. He told both sides to strive to create a harmonious society. 
society. But before he can finish, Peter disappears. The two doctors start arguing again, wrestling their tongues rather than muscles. Olivia quickly mediates between them, stopping their bullshit and easing the tension. But surprisingly, it seems that nobody cares where Peter has gone. The scene shifts to a group of bald observers witnessing this historic moment. The leader comments that those people don't remember Peter anymore, and somehow, it's as if Peter never existed. And with that, season three comes to an end. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.